Hello and welcome to Cybersecure Ed. Today's topic is what are the technology survival skills for the next generation? My name is Claudio Popa and I will be your host. In the background, completely silent, is Stephen Hurley, who is pulling levers and pressing buttons to make sure this podcast is going well. And our special guest today is Diana Barbosa from the ICTC. Hello, Diana. Hello, Claudio. Thank you so much for having me. I have so many questions. I just want to jump right in. Sure. Let's do it. I see that you are extremely prolific on social media. <laughs> and clearly, you're dealing with a lot of uh, students. And you're teaching them mm -hmm. all kinds of things that are technology related. It's almost like mm -hmm. it's perfectly fit to attract my attention. So, so I see all of your posts and they're great. Mm -hmm. And I, I see all these, all these great programs. And what I'd like to do is, is ask you about all these things and what are cyber titans and cyber dragons and the word can code comes up. And, and first mm -hmm. of all, what do you do at the ICTC? What does ICTC stand for? Great place to start. The Information Communications and Technology Council, which is quite a mouthful. So ICTC is, is does quite well. And we're a not-for-profit organization um, that really has a research and policy side, uh, lots of great reports about the labor market, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, technology, what's up and coming, forecasting where we're going. And then we have a talent uh, capacity building side that allows us to build talent programs uh, in order to meet some of the demands that we're finding through our research. So all of our core programs are based on evidence. And uh, just a note on our research side, we do provide them policy advice to governments based on our findings. Evidence-based programs, you don't say. Yeah. So, yes, I do. <laughs> so we look at that and, <laughs> and, and off we go. And I think that's part of the reason that, uh, you know, you say I'm, I'm so prolific on social media. I'm very proud every day of the, the work that we do because I really feel that we're a, a driving force in helping to di uh, close the digital skills gap that, uh, you know, Canada is facing. Mm hmm. Do you have a sign on your door that says there be dragons or there be cyber dragons? <laughs> well, I am very proud of our cyber dragons. And, and just to clarify, our program, our, our overall program is Cyber Titan, which is our national cybersecurity competition, uh, where we have teams competing uh, through our U.S. partner, Cyber Patriot. Our Canadian teams are amongst over 5,000 teams competing globally. Uh, what we then do is when that competition closes is take all the scores of our uh, Canadian teams and then invite the top four teams from the East top four teams from the West, one wildcard team, which uh, is an all-girls team, and one middle school team in order to then come to Ottawa for, again, a full-day uh, simulated competition where somebody will be named Cyber Titan. The Cyber Dragons have been getting a lot of publicity. Uh, however, they are a middle school team uh, based out of New Brunswick. Interesting. That's so cool. Now, the, how long has the Cyber Titan program been going on? We are in our third year, so this May 4th will be our uh, third competition. Uh, we have grown uh, to just a little over 200 teams uh, from 78. Uh, another stat that I'm very proud of is that in our inaugural year, we had zero all-girls team, and this year we carried 28 all-girls teams. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. Do you... Um... Do you track the progress of some of these students as they as they go on? Do you do you know whether they end up in in similar sectors or in professions that have something to do with the cybers? That is a great question, Claudio. And, and I'm going to say yes and no. A lot of the data that we have now comes from feedback that we receive from our partners, from the educators and mentors that are involved, uh, from the students themselves. Uh, we do have a challenge with how much information we can track uh, about the students, right? There are all kinds of, and I don't need to tell you, uh, mm -hmm. you know, privacy implications. Uh, so we, you know, have the students' basic information, but as far as tracking where they're going into, um, we don't do that aside from getting those really great news stories. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example in uh, New Brunswick, um, 
Power New Brunswick has a program specifically uh, for uh, internships for high school students, and they have had some great success and shared some really great stories about Cyber Titan uh, participants that have taken on roles and been quite successful with their organization. Uh, we have other, um, again, team members that have taken on, you know, co-op positions within cybersecurity and then have been offered uh, part-time roles while they finish school. Uh, so we do have those really great news stories. And I, I can't tell you enough how many uh, stories we also receive about kids who, um, you know, I, I don't know what it was like for you to went to when you went to school, but I wasn't the most athletic kid. And if you weren't on the sports team, you know, that was it for you. Uh, maybe choir, uh, but that was pretty much it. Um, and where the uh, Cyber Titan teams have really given a place for the students that are, uh, you know, more technology inclined uh, to have a place where they're, uh, you know, they're being part of a competition, they're being part of a bigger community, and they're being recognized uh, for their great work. And we hear a lot of these stories about, you know, my kid was, you know, not willing to participate or my Mm -hmm. kid was not willing to, you know, didn't feel like they belonged anywhere. And now as part of a Cyber Titan team have have come out of those shells. So we pride uh, or I'm personally very proud of our program because it's... um, I know this might be going into something we, we want to continue to discuss, but it's, it, you know, part of it is the technical skills, absolutely. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, teamwork and leadership, communication, uh, leadership skills that are built throughout the program as well. That's right. And you know what? The, just the fact that the program helps students on so many levels from leadership to to having a place for nerds like me, I would have loved <laughs> to have this kind of program available when I was going through school. Um, uh, this is the type of thing that we need more of. And, and, and I think that fundamentally digital literacy should be a, a part of, of every grades, um, mix of education, I want to mm-hmm. say, but of course there's a, there's a line and, and in previous episodes, we have talked about the advent of ed tech. In the classroom, and where do you draw the line between, you know, having interactive technologies versus privacy invasive uh, technologies? When do you stop collecting information versus how much information do you need to collect in order to fine tune a uh, technology program to the needs of the students? It's it's an inflection point that we're at, and it's an interesting time that we're living mm-hmm. through. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that that's what makes the cybersecurity program uh, such an interesting uh, and, and appropriate place to focus. Because when I look at cyber, and I'm talking about the fact that, you know, we're, we're preparing kids for to explore careers in cyber. But what it also does is it explores how do you protect yourself in line? How do you protect your data in line? How do you protect your personal safety online? Uh, so when we look at the technology, that you were just naming and where do you draw that line? It, it really, I think, comes down to, um, you know, education of the educators mm-hmm. uh, and how, uh, what is it that you're trying to accomplish with the technology? So uh, one of the things that uh, I've noticed, and I'm not going to name any names, is that there's sometimes a lot of technology in the classroom that just uh, perpetuates the passive use of technology. And uh, when I say passive use, I'm talking about, you know, watching a YouTube video, yes. uh, being able to, I mean, research for, for some purposes is, is great, but just being able to read something online uh, is not what uh, the digital skills that are required for the future. Uh, so it's not, I wouldn't say, I, I can't answer the question, do you need more tech, less tech? I would say you need the right tech that is actually there to enable the kids to learn the skills that they need to thrive. So 90% of jobs today have a digital component. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we will get to a point where, you know, it's 100%. So for me, having my, I mean, I have three kids of my own and their digital literacy for me, I now place uh, in the same bucket as I did making sure that they got swimming lessons. (laughs) 
I that was a skill that I think that they need to have to survive their every day because no matter what job they get, uh, chances are they will have to open an email. Uh, and it, once they open that email, they need to be able to make a decision whether, first of all, it was safe to even open that email. And then if there's information on that email, you know what they're going to do with it, because you can have all the firewalls and cybersecurity in the world. But if you've got somebody there who doesn't know not to click that, you know, fishy link, not, you know, pun intended, uh, then they're going to click it and, and you're out of luck. Um, Absolutely. So I, that, that's where, um, you know, my focus um, is and where my, my thinking goes around ed tech in the classroom. I agree. And, and so it sounds like digital literacy is becoming more of a survival skill than something that's been optional for so many years. This is, this is what you mentioned as a passive, passive activity in the classroom is something we've observed as well. So as you probably know, I work with the Knowledge Flow Foundation. Uh, and we create opportunities to empower kids to be cyber safety champions. Mm -hmm. So of course, this is this is an incentive. And of course, they love the certificates and they love the recognition. But what we try to do as well is to empower them, not just to protect themselves, but to help others. And so yes. we're trying to create <laughs> webs of awareness, cy cyber situational awareness. We, we try to ask the kids to say that without spitting. <laughs> and so it's, it's a lot of fun to watch kids try to anticipate not just what can happen to them through their inbox or through uh, active surfing, but what can happen to their little brother or what mm -hmm. can happen to their peers in class, or even assist the teacher in saying, hey, you know what, uh, maybe you shouldn't necessarily park us in front of YouTube. Uh, maybe we, we could check out this interactive game uh, and, and, and then come up with suggestions as to how to find nicknames to open an account or sufficiently long passwords that are also unique. Uh, and that, that, sort of frictionless um, advice, that kind of support um, is something that we try to we try to teach. And certainly I've been lucky because I've had the opportunity to work with the ICTC, which is a your, your fantastic organization. And as you know, you and I uh, enjoyed putting together a couple of webinars that are now, I think, hosted on YouTube. Um, they are for all all teachers to for enjoy all, parking yeah. students mm -hmm. passively in front of. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so that's that's something that's out there. Um, I won't mention where it is because you know we want to have people do their own research, uh, but it's out there, likely on the ICTC YouTube channel. It is on the ICTC YouTube channel. Um, uh, but you know, but you make an interesting point because I, I think um, you know you, you talk about uh, you know you kind of jokingly said you know to sit passively in front of and 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 there's nothing wrong with sitting in front of a video and consuming information um but what's the follow-up to that so and you and i had discussions even when we built those videos around you know you don't just want to send them by me and say watch this but there's some guidance around you know what should conversations sound like after you watch these videos and how do you expand on that how do you get students to then you know talk about the reactions talk about their experiences right it, it doesn't all necessarily need to be about you know using uh, tech you can have conversations around tech and there is a program um, that is, uh, is is being sort of rolled out right now uh, again in the east coast where uh, they're looking at teaching cybersecurity to young kids and they're making it part of the literacy curriculum so mm -hmm. they're, they're using flashcards and they're you know they're they're asking questions and they're saying, you know, what do you see in these pictures and what do you think is going on? And they're learning vocabulary. Um, and I and I really think that that is the, the right way uh, to do it. And, and I'll give you an example. So we have uh, ICTC has a program called Focus on Information Technology. And it's a program that um, schools, high schools would register into. And what we do is help create pathways based on the courses that they're learning, uh, taking based on the the feedback that we've received for industry, from industry and said, okay, if students are taking these courses, they are uh, acquiring these skills that align to what an industry said that they require. 
And it's a mix of both uh, skills like communication and teamwork, along with more technical skills uh, like the computer science courses, business mm-hmm. analysis, networking. Um, and what happens is that you, 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 you know, you get sometimes schools saying, oh, well, uh, but uh, I don't have this component. I don't, I, I, we don't have uh, media management um, or, you know, multimedia creation. How do we, we do that? And it's as simple as, well, you have an art project that you traditionally use construction paper and glue on. Well, there's a lot of applications online that allow kids to provide, to create digital art. Uh, so you can use that to create that. Uh, there's English courses, and I know there's a, a couple of schools that have started to do this that are working, uh, you know, cross departments uh, to say, I'm in my computer science class, or I've taken something on cybersecurity, and I needed to write a report to find, uh, to be able to communicate my findings. And they have the English teachers marking those reports to make sure that the students are communicating effectively. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that the the digital work needs to be integrated into every day because yes. I come into my job and I said my title is director of education and uh, um, education and standards. And I wouldn't say I have a tech job, but I come in every day to emails, to my phone, to, you know, talking to different people to, you know, when I go out and I'm, I am doing a cyber day, I'm setting up computers, I need to communicate what I need, I need to, you know, write reports. So all my technical skills are integrated, I, I don't have a delineation between the part of my day where I'm not doing something technical and when I am, right? It's all integrated into what we need to do. That's right. Uh, and, and I think that that's uh, what needs to happen. And I think it is happening in, 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 in a lot of schools is making those connections around um, uh, that it, it's just the way you function and the way life is. And like I said, it's, it's the, the digital literacy is, is, is literacy now. <laughs> like It's just part of literacy. That's right. It's just yeah. basic literacy and you don't have to say digital anymore almost Almost, Uh, and and the way you're making those connections is so important because we always think about the gaps that we're we're, we were talking about uh appearing between uh those with access to technology and and those without access to technology Mm -hmm. and certain jurisdictions communities that maybe don't have the connectivity or the internet access or the funds to to have Uh, electronics and you mentioned flashcards and you mentioned these Mm -hmm. various fairly low-tech ways to ensure that kids are at least exposed to the lingo the terminology that you have that preparedness so that when they do touch technology they are not the technology is not foreign to them and you know how easily and how readily young people adapt to new tools and um, and systems that are designed for them. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm just going to agree with what you just said. Uh, well, I, no, anytime I, you agree with me is, is a, yeah, is a I, reason to celebrate. I, I don't want to just talk for the sake of talking. I, no, I this completely is great. agree uh, with well, you. Well, yeah. I was just going to ask mm-hmm. you, uh, what? So, so the ICTC has... Uh, cyber Titan uh, program, but everything that the cyber uh, that the the um, ICTC does is student focused. It's the one of the reasons I really enjoy uh, working with the ICTC is because it actually cares about student pro- uh, mm-hmm. privacy and it respects it. Right, so it's, mm-hmm. there's a fundamental respect for this, and and the policies that are in place behind the scenes mm-hmm. also embrace that over time, uh, which which is delightful. Uh, to see. Uh, and, and I guess one of my questions is, what about, in fact, what about reaching more broadly? How, how do we bridge those gaps to communities that really have very, very little hope for, uh, for imminent access to technology? Is there, is there a plan? Is there a medium-term strategy? 
I'm glad that you threw the word imminent because I'm oh, the sister was starting to go very dark, and I thought, well, don't tell me there's no hope for these communities. <laughs> so, uh, but I think you're right as far as imminent. I know that there has been a lot of work to bring connectivity uh, to remote areas. Uh, I can't remember the name of the program now, but there is a program uh, in place that is launching basically satellites up into the air in order to bring um, internet connection to those communities that are limited. Uh, There are programs available through our federal government uh, for very low income families that do provide, uh, you know, internet connections at at very, very low costs. Um, And so there are certain uh, things that have happened uh, in order to to help facilitate uh, the access to information and to being online. However, uh, with that uh, said, we are, you know, there's still many communities. Um, and, and I know that uh, in speaking to some folks last year, I mean, we have communities that whose main concern is having clean water for them to drink. And mm-hmm. quite honestly, their internet connection is, you know, you know, maybe third down the line out of some of the basic right. necessities that, that the community needs to focus on. Um, however, at the same time, uh, those kids that are in those communities uh, need to gain the skills so that they can, again, be able to then support their own communities as they, um, you know, as they grow and as, as they develop into contributing members of those communities. So uh, I, ICTC has been very cognizant about, uh, you know, what solutions can we provide provide to uh, to order to, to kind of level the playing field as uh, as much as we can. Uh, right now, the Cyber Day that we deliver uh, is a high tech, so you need to have access to a laptop uh, because it is about going behind the scenes and fixing things. Uh, but I am uh, actually planning, and, and you'll be the first, this is the first time I'm kind of saying it publicly, I am planning an international Cyber Day uh, this coming October uh, to coincide with um, Info Security Month. And one of the things that I want to make sure that uh, we have as part of this program is what I'm calling a no-tech solution so that there's really no reason that uh, there would be a group that could not participate. And there are some coding activities, computational thinking activities, you know, code breaking uh, mm-hmm. activities um, that uh, students can do uh, that may be in communities that just do not have access to right. technology. And, and and I think that they're a bit of a forgotten group sometimes. Uh, and it's easy to, uh, I think it's easy to do that, especially, I mean, I live in Toronto, big metropolitan area. It's, you take, for, I get upset when I lose my Wi-Fi connection on the subway, right? Um, that's my biggest problem. Uh, my <laughs> kids get upset when our Wi-Fi is slow, right? Because we're all watching Netflix at the same time. First world problems. Yeah, but the, but really, but, but you think about it, you know, we joke around to say first world problems problems, but we do have a lot of communities in, you know, what we call our first world who are, you know, living in conditions that uh, that don't allow f- uh, for such easy access to technology mm-hmm. and, and for that kind of technology. For sure. And, yeah. Just picking up on your point about uh, International Cyber Day and, and, and no tech, um, that idea is particularly appealing to me because so many people are overwhelmed as soon as you say computer they say ah no i'm not a computer literate person or i'm i'm not computer savvy or or please keep that away from me or or whatever um and i was recently interviewed on a very interesting documentary about world war ii and i talked about how swedish uh, cryptographers broke Nazi codes with just pencil and paper. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) that's the kind of anecdotes that resonate Mm -hmm. with kids because, hey, you know what? You've all got a pencil and paper. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have paper, you've got some white walls somewhere. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Much to the chagrin of parents uh, everywhere. But but it's so cool to to have a piece of paper with a code on it and, and watch kids as they're solving these things, but also to hear the anecdotes that that literally illustrate the fact that it was people just like them who changed the world with pencil and paper. So it's not just about being part of code.org or or the hour of code or, or whatever. If you don't have access to it, that's okay too. If you have mm-hmm. access to it, then 
that's fantastic. Help others gain access to it as mm -hmm. well. Get all your friends involved. My kids love to play uh, math, uh, an interactive math game, which 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 looks like uh, uh, not. I was going to say Dungeons and Dragons, but it's just so more so so f much more visual, and they're incentivized to keep on going up uh, in levels. And so uh, this type of of multi-prong approach, I think, is what's going to deliver that literacy, right? You don't have to say digital literacy anymore. It's just the fact that we live in a modern world, and that's just what has to be uh, in place. Now, just to switch gears a little bit, uh, again, relevant to your point about priorities, when I, you know, I've gone to schools and I've gone to school boards and have uh, have talked about the importance of of cyber safety and upholding the privacy of kids' personal information uh, by law or because it's a human right or or whatnot. Call me crazy, but I think the privacy rights of of kids are are important. And they've they've actually said, hey, you know what? We're doing all these things. We're keeping your kids safe inside the school. We're locking the doors. There's no active shooter incident. Just look what's going on in the states. Um, and and now we're protecting your kids from the coronavirus. We've got a lot on our plate. How important is your issue around whether our ed tech is collecting your kids' personal information? And 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 that's an interesting lens. Yeah. To mm -hmm. to it's it's almost a Boolean lens to to put it through. Um, have you seen that kind of dichotomy of everything or nothing, or or perhaps the fact that hey, you know, we're doing enough already, so why should we bother with the digital aspect of protection? Um, you know, I I don't I, I would hesitate to say that the attitude uh, would be why bother with digital protection or uh, it's going to go back to a point that I made a little while ago around educating the educators because I I'll admit I uh, worked for uh, a big bank for many many years and I was a little bit blind to uh, you know what really went behind the scenes and the risks around cybersecurity uh, until one day I got an email from my IT department that I clicked on and it turns out that they were testing me. It turns out there were all kinds of red flags in that email as to why I shouldn't have clicked that link. <laughs> um, and so after I clicked it, I got a little note that says, you failed our test and this is why. Um, that was maybe six, seven years ago. I have never forgotten that lesson and I know what to look for now. Um, so when you look at the, the the pressures that educators are under to, yes, create a, a a safe space for learning, a safe space, uh, you know, physical, because it is scary when you think about the, the fact, I mean, I, I I, I went to school, I kept their doors open all the time, right? And it's, it's, you, you have that thought every time I get to my kid's school and I realize I got to ring the doorbell that they're trying to keep a shooter mm -hmm. out. That, yeah. That's scary. Uh, and then trying to keep up with, you know, uh, curriculum and parents and, uh, you know, varying abilities within the classroom. Uh, that's a lot on their plate. And now, you know, we're coming and saying, well, this threat is real and you need to make sure that you're protecting the data. I think that that is still an obscure um, kind of concept. It's right? abstract. It, it, That's for it's sure. It's very it's abstract. It, it's something that, you know, they hear about or they see somewhere. Over Christmas, I watched all the Die Hard movies and I saw the one with the cybersecurity breach and I couldn't help but think, wow, at the time, because this came out in the early, you know, in the 90s, yeah. this must have seemed so futuristic. But there's no way it would have taken the hacker that long to do that. They could probably do it in two clicks now, <laughs> That's right? That's right. <laughs> But I think, again, I think, uh, I mean, I have spoken in front of teacher groups and talked about autonomous vehicles, and they think that this is something that's so futuristic, and it's not. <laughs> Right. Like it's not that futuristic. And I think it's the same thing with cybersecurity that for those that are not like us that are, are seeing it every day. I wake up every morning to, you know, all the articles because I, I you know, I subscribe to them, to my po cybersecurity podcast, to my LinkedIn that is full of people in cyber. If you're not waking up to that all, every day, you don't 
you know, you're not aware, you don't understand the risks. And I think that that education piece uh, needs to happen uh, more uh, because I really believe that we have educators that that care about our, our children and about all of the different facets of safety. Absolutely. But I think this, soft, this cyber safety piece uh, is, is like you said, an abstract. I think w- we can go as far as cyberbullying. I think we've understood that that can be a real problem. Uh, but there, but there's a lot. I, I always talk about the depth and breadth of cybersecurity. There's so many different angles to it, um, and that's the piece that needs to, uh, you know, educators need to have a, a better understanding mm-hmm. of. Uh, in order to do that security. Now, of course, I could probably do a whole other podcast on, you know, well, whose responsibility is it to make sure they have that information that's and right. how could they not? But, you know, I think that's part of the challenge. Absolutely. And and I think we're going to leave it at that. I think that's fantastic. We see this as a trio of uh, accountability. We see educators, the front line, the teachers. Uh, we see the students, and we see parents as well. Uh, and that's an important part of creating that, um, that friendly environment and, 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 and supporting that context for students and kids to absorb this type of thing. So it's fantastic. I really love the, uh, the discussion we've just had. I think we should, um, you know, together we should move forward to just call it literacy. But, yeah. <laughs> as, opposed to, as opposed to wasting extra characters on the digital part. Uh, certainly uh, train the trainer, train the teacher, train the parent uh, is a... Uh, is a focus and certainly we're trying to train uh, kids and students to to help others um, as part of these digital literacy initiatives. So thank you very much to our special guest, Diana Barbosa from the ICTC. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen Hurley, for making it all happen and doing your magic in the background. And we'll see you next time on the Cyber Secure Ed podcast. 